Hey, thank you so much. So, all right, let's see if I can get the mic here. I'm not going to hold it like a karaoke mic like Jay Stanton did, but... Yeah, speak louder, okay. So, anyway, my, my talk today um, kind of takes us all into an arena that we don't normally discuss, but that I sort of saw the need to discuss. Uh, I realize that what I'm going to talk about today may be highly controversial uh, and may not sit right with, uh, you know, with a few people. But at the very least, I'm definitely putting myself at risk here uh, for being accused of being a major buzzkill. Uh, but this isn't some marketing campaign, I assure you. Uh, hopefully you're willing to suspend disbelief and you're willing um, to consider the evidence as I go down this potentially paradigm-shifting rabbit hole uh, with you guys today. So I don't doubt that some of you are aware of at least some of the issues that I'm going to be talking about here. Um, but it's also clear to me that many of you may not be. And as a movement, I think we all need to be if we want any hope of being able to make a positive difference in this world and really survive uh, as a movement. It's pretty impossible to make meaningful progress in any worthwhile area without truly understanding the way the system, with the you know, big S, right? The way, that's, the way the system actually works. And then progressively strategizing around that. And I think that a lot of the issues that we're talking about here have the potential to kind of make or break this ancestral health movement that we're all a part of. Um, right now, in my mind, it's in danger. Um, and it already has, in so many places, either been co-opted by corporate interests, right? We've all seen that happening. Or it's degenerated into something that can only be termed a fad. Uh, and so much of what so many of us have worked so hard for, I think, has the potential to be conflated with that and sort of lumped together and disregarded by history at a tremendous cost. I think, to what this has the potential to offer humanity and health. So I'll tell you up front that none of this is intended as fear porn, simply a dose of reality for which I'm going to offer some possible strategies to effectively address uh, some of these issues. Now, we don't live in a Hollywood movie, but there really is, there really kind of is a matrix of sorts. Um, what we think of as our reality, uh, to a meaningful extent, really kind of isn't. And even where many people sort of suspect that things aren't quite right or they might be different than maybe assumed, um, um, you know, most people are pretty happy to just kind of take their blue pill and go about their usual business. Now, I guess this talk is meant to be kind of a wake-up call for those of you who have the willingness to take the proverbial red pill and be willing to see or at least consider things a little differently. So nothing meaningful really can ever be accomplished with anything worthwhile until steps are taken to really see things as they are and not simply how we've always imagined them to be or maybe want them to be. So the original presentation I tried to put together for this ended up being three or four hours worth of material. <laughs> I thought, yeah, they're not going to go for that probably. Um, so I've had to seriously, like, brutally and painfully pare this thing down and, and try to stick to more of the rudimentary basics. I've been, you know, just slashing content and whatever and wiping tears out of my eyes for days. Um, I've realized that there's literally no possible way I can do this topic justice in just 30 to 40 minutes. No way at all, but I'm going to try. I'm going to give it my best. At some point, I may offer a more detailed lecture or webinar on the subject if you guys you know, express an interest in that and maybe take a deeper dive into it all because God knows I have the material. But just sort of think of this as your appetizer. So a lot of you guys have heard about this. You know, the U.S. News and World Report offers its top 100 list of best dietary approaches for health and well-being every single year. And every single year, both paleo and ketogenic dietary approaches literally consistently rank dead last on the list, like way behind even things like Insure and Jenny Craig, you know? <laughs> like, how can this be, right? It's like, what the heck is the matter with these people? How can it be that a diet based solidly in human evolutionary science, right, human anatomy and physiology, and something in alignment with our genetic heritage that's focused on whole organic foods of unadulterated origin and naturally forged meats from healthy animals, how can this possibly be considered the worst possible diet for humanity, right? And why is it that all the sound debunking of low-fat diets in recent years has resulted pretty much in zero meaningful change to government-sanctioned dietary guidelines, right? I'm guessing by now, or not by now, but I'm guessing that by the end of this talk, a lot of you are gonna be wearing this mainstream news ranking, like the badge of honor that I do, you know, but where do we start when it comes to making sense of this? Well, I'll give you your first hint. 
you always need to follow the money. Now, here's where we shift into conspiracy land. But I promise you, I will not be handing out tinfoil hats here, okay? Um, this, there is, in fact, a genuine conspiracy here. Not all conspiracies, you know, or conspiracy theories or whatever are based upon fabricated or kooky paranoia, right? And just because something is presented as a conspiracy does not mean it's not true. Um, no one should be considered paranoid or, or some conspiracy not simply because they happen to be informed, right? Um, or because maybe the mainstream media, or Snopes, which is kind of a hack, you know, watchdog um, thing, you know, points that finger. We need to use all of the available information that we have in order to make rational inferences from the facts. And it's about logical, okay, this is not working out so well. Why is this flopping over? Is it this? Is it that? Yeah, I don't think I can hold it. Let me, anybody have duct tape? Yes. What do you know? Duct tape. <laughs> Perfect. So, <laughs> you know, when you ask, yeah, well, ask and ye shall receive, I guess. Okay. So, I mean, it's about logical dot connecting, right, in tandem with solid data and rational evidence. So consider the following. All right. This is a partial representation of many of the transnational corporate interests that are either supportive of big agribusiness or stand to profit from a human population basing their diet on mostly carbohydrate-based foods, right? What I've termed many times is metabolic kindling um, and even metabolic enslavement. It's a way of eating, in other words, that is designed to keep us all more or less perpetually hungry and in need of regular meals and snacks, right? I'm hoping most of you are aware of my wood stove analogy. Unfortunately, I don't have time to revisit that here. Um, but, you know, by the way, I've tossed the weight loss industry in a casket on here to represent the interest of undertakers as a little extra seasoning. Uh, I only included factory farming and CAFO operations here because those industries are really dependent on and are much more likely to side with the interest of big agribusiness without whom they pretty much couldn't exist. So not one single one of these interests is a friend to anyone having any integrity within the ancestral health movement. This collage of transnational corporate interests, if you will, represents literally trillions upon trillions of dollars. And as far as I'm concerned, other than the petroleum that we're all dependent on to one degree or another, and as of course, as Jim Morrison famously once uh, stated, uh, no one gets out of here alive. So an undertaker may be needed at some point, but none of the rest of what's represented here stands to make so much as a penny from me or anyone else applying my information, I know. But I think that's true of a number of us here within the ancestral health community. And of course, that makes us extremely problematic. Now, these are many, not remotely all, of the products associated with major food manufacturers. Every single one of them carbohydrate-based, right? Think these guys might have some influence in resisting changes uh, with respect to mainstream dietary guidelines or may exert a variety of efforts to instill confusion, misinformation, and disinformation regarding anything and everything related to these interests? You better believe it. Obviously, all this unnecessary mass metabolic and immunologic derangement is going to lead to massive, massive pharmaceutical profits, almost beyond the dreams of avarice. Funny how all this just sort of works together. So this CBS News headline, study shows 70% of Americans take prescription drugs, was from 2013, five years ago. You guys think this percentage has gone down since then? I seriously doubt it. And these are last year's profits from only the top 10 pharmaceutical companies alone. The numbers you see beneath the names are in billions with a B. Oh, and by the way, blood sugar medicine is a $137 billion a year industry. You know, so ka-ching. <laughs> and then we have the recently popularized push toward, of necessity, carb-based vegetarian and vegan um, diets basically getting promoted all over the place in an inexplicable way, including a rash of very well-funded vegan propaganda films most of us have probably been familiar with. You know, filmed by blockbuster directors like James Cameron and black, backed by celebrities like Joaquin Phoenix and Leonardo DiCaprio and whoever else. I mean, where is all this coming from, right? Is this really some altruistic movement that's being promoted 
for our best health and well-being? I mean, since when do they care about that? It, less than 5% of the American public identifies as either being vegetarian or vegan, by the way. And depending on which studies you look at, somewhere between 75 to 84% of all vegetarians and vegans end up abandoning that dietary approach within a decade or less, and almost always due to health-related issues, right? And former vegetarians and vegans, by the way, also outnumber current vegetarians and vegans by a factor of no less than three to one, right? So where is all this money and top-tier funding coming from to promote this on film and in the press? It certainly isn't capitalizing on some mainstream popularity of the subject, right? Well, good old Bill Gates, his Silicon Valley minions and other multinational corporate interests have set their sights on replacing real meat with what they inexplicably term plant-based meats. I, hashtag WTF, right? <laughs> In the diets of Americans. Mark my words, the rest of the world is next, I promise you. Bill Gates secured the national U.S. distribution rights for veggie burgers made from wheat, soy, and God knows what else, right? So expect, and in fact, I just saw something on Science Daily the other day, expect to see increased numbers of articles popping through both the mainstream media and science news concerning the life-threatening evils of animal source foods. It's all part of the campaign, right? These people have unprecedented access to the media and their inability to get them to do whatever they want. So the dark underbelly of this fabricated sort of health and environmental movement is for nothing other than massive profit. And it's not just about advancing the popularity of, uh, of veganism and carb-based diets. There's a very real potential here we need to be concerned about with respect to losing our access to quality animal source foods we need in order to be optimally healthy. So for those of us that aren't going to be buying the veggie burgers, and I doubt anybody in here will, We've got this whole, you know, th they've got this covered, right? Right, so there is also considerable talk about carbon taxing animal source foods now, and the implementation of this, by the way, is highly, highly probable. It's all under the guise of saving the environment, while it's really about collecting money and discouraging meat eating in favor of grains and legumes, which are infinitely more profitable, right? The big monocrops, grass-fed and finished meat has literally the opposite effect on the environment from feedlot meat as you all know. But the taxing criteria would be exactly the same for all forms of meat, except for, of course, the, ve you know, the vegan or the plant-based meats. And this is also overlooking the fact that the number one customer for environmentally compromising big oil is big agribusiness. <laughs> you know, big pharma's in there too. It's outrageous, but when has that ever stopped bureaucracy? So now this article, this little gem of an article, appeared in Business Insider in April of this year. The article was based on yet another bogus observational study that claimed to conclude that nuts were purportedly a healthier source of protein than meat. Be like a squirrel, the scientists said, nibbling on nuts over meat. I wish I was kidding. <laughs> now, do you really believe that you have the digestive tract and physio physiological makeup of a rodent? <laughs> I like what they have listed under the anus of the squirrel there. Anyway, magic happens here. <laughs> I mean, what is really going on, right? Okay, so consider this also. These are, for the most part, extremely typical baby foods that are overwhelmingly represented on food shelves in grocery stores. With one or two exceptions here, I'm showing organic versions of these baby foods, right, which are far better quality and generally far more expensive than what most strapped families in this country can afford. These are solid, these are the solid foods that are introduced to babies as soon as they enter into the process of weaning, right? Assuming they were lucky enough to be breastfed in the first place, something, of course, the United States government is taking an international stand against now in favor of promoting, right, uh, you know, those horrific infant formulas instead, which shows you exactly who owns our government. But take a look at, at each of these labels sometime, you know, when you're in, in, in the, these stores, really, just start turning them over um, and try to keep your jaw from hitting the floor. Virtually every single one of them is carbohydrate loaded. In fact, most of these are exclusively carbohydrate based. Now the protein value in most baby foods is negligible. The low fat content of baby foods or the, or the quality fat content of baby foods is also effectively negligible. There is zero DHA or much of anything needed for the development of a baby's brain. So what the heck are we setting up? 
So here we have a baby's meal in a jar, all organic with no preservatives, unsweetened and unsalted. And I'm sure most parents would feel as though they were giving their infant a top shelf meal here, right? And if I had to guess, I would imagine this is a pretty pricey jar of baby food, but what is this baby actually getting? Well, let's look a little more closely at the label. So this is supposedly a meat entree, but it's overwhelmingly loaded with starch. Out of the 18 whopping grams of carbs in a single meal, two grams are fiber, just two grams, three grams are sugar, and the rest is pure starch. Now, three grams of sugar added to 13 grams of starch which gives you 16 grams of utilizable carbohydrate, may not sound like much to you and me, but consider how much that amounts to in a tiny baby. And in a healthy adult bloodstream, there's never more than maybe four to five grams of glucose flowing through your veins at any given time. And that's if you're healthy, right? And that's assuming that you're dependent on glucose as your primary source of fuel. So a five gram dose of dietary sugar for an adult is literally doubling the amount in the bloodstream normally allowed. And remember, all utilizable carbohydrates are sugar once they hit your bloodstream, right? Now, I don't know what the exact number should be for a baby of glucose grams in their bloodstream, but let's just say that even the three grams of sugar in a single serving, all on its own, is likely more than doubling what is supposed to be there, right? Um, pretty good opiate hit, I'd say. I don't know how many of you guys saw Jay Stanton talk earlier today, but it's like total soul brother, man. Um, so, you know, grains, which also contain exorphins, you know, by the way, morphine-like compounds are the top ingredient in this meat entree. And, and chicken is literally the last ingredient on the list, with the meal supplying no more than three grams of protein, some of which is undoubtedly coming from gluten, which is totally indigestible to literally any human alive and is always, always health compromising, right? Anyone see something wrong with this picture, at least something suspicious and worthy of concern? Now, it's important to keep in mind that babies are literally born in an effective state of ketogenic adaptation, right? This isn't just me talking, right? And, and, um, you know, and for good reason. Their little brains are demanding roughly 85% of their total caloric energy intake. And ketones, which are veritable brain superfuel, efficiently supply literally four times the ATP of, of glucose. And, are the, and they're supposed to be the major fuel for neonatal development. So the moment we begin feeding a baby sugar or starch, ketosis comes to a screeching halt, and the child and its brain development become fu fundamentally dependent, enslaved, if you will, conveniently, to a carbohydrate-based metabolism. Do you really think this is a coincidence? I mean, think, who does this serve, right? Where do we go when we follow the money here? This is begun by the food industry, et cetera, at the earliest possible point in life. And think of every baby snack food you've ever seen, like Cheerios, right? You see the parents sitting there with a little Ziploc baggie of Cheerios, goldfish crackers, saltines, you know, if we're lucky, maybe fruit. What are we setting children up for in life? I would submit that there's nothing, I repeat, nothing accidental or coincidental about any of this. It's all by design and part of the earliest possible conditioning process by industry. Now, this study published in May of 2015 took a close look at the actual impact of dietary guidelines on the health of United States citizens between the years 1965 and 2011. And shockingly, at least to some, um, the rates of obesity and all kinds of metabolic diseases during that time increased dramatically. But the party line about why this was happening was basically that we were all just too stupid, too dumb and lazy, you know, to follow the rules, right? But that's not what the study showed. Even more shockingly, uh, it clearly showed that Americans actually had been following the rules and had been diligently following government guidelines all along to our collective and undeniable detriment. And in fact, the more closely we followed the rules, the sicker and more obese we became as a society. And in that span of time, we radically increased our intake of dietary carbohydrates, starchy foods, and we re radically reduced our intake of dietary saturated fat directly in line with the recommendations. Now, it was a total failure and it ultimately achieved the opposite effect that, you know, of its purported intent, right? The science is here, the solid evidence is right here, but has this changed official guidelines at all? Did the authorities say, whoops, our bad? No, they continually just keep reinforcing the same tired nonsense. You know, you tell a big enough lie long enough and loudly enough and people just sort of you know, accept that as a matter of course. 
And you know, this solid evidence and, and other untold scores of evidence are just quietly being swept under the rug or simply ignored and disregarded. And frankly, there's no money in it. Now, for decades now, we've been essentially asked by mainstream dietitians and nutritionists, medical authorities, and government agencies to base the foundation of our diet on carbohydrates, right? While marginalizing or even eliminating animal fats and God knows cholesterol, evil cholesterol, almost entirely. So U.S. Department of Agriculture's food pyramid, right? No conflict of interest there, right? It's been basically telling us to base our diet on things like grains, legumes, potatoes, rice, and other so-called complex carbs. Um, is literally a modern day experiment and a failed one at that. No Paleolithic human people group in the history of the human species has ever eaten a diet remotely resembling what the USDA, the government, or medical and dietitian authorities suggest as optimal. And this advice is clearly, clearly not served as well, to put it mildly. But how did this flip-flop of misguided mainstream thinking and vilifying the animal source foods we were designed to consume ever happen in the first place? Well, anyone remember this? In, in a rare bit of investigative journalism, this 2016 New York Times article reads, the sugar industry paid scientists in the 1960s to play down the link between sugar and heart disease and promote saturated fat as the culprit instead. And basically, here's the documentation. Published in the Journal of the American Medical Association, it was stated in this internal medicine special communication that Together with other recent analyses of sugar industry documents, our findings suggest the industry sponsored a research program in the 1960s and 1970s that successfully cast doubt about the hazards of sucrose while promoting fat as the dietary culprit in coronary heart disease. And by the way, there's also good evidence that the vegetable industry had a, had a big hand in the vilification of animal fats as well. I mean, there's plenty of profitable collusion to be found here. And then we're also up against the FDA that's supposed to be protecting us, right? In a rare piece of extremely in-depth journalism and integrity, Charles Seif, who's a journalism professor at New York University, wrote this excisive uh, expose in 2015. And it's all very well documented. It's important to keep in mind that the reach of the FDA stretches far beyond, far beyond medications, and definitely includes our food supply, right? Food and Drug Administration. In this article, where he exposes all the evidence in detail, he states that, and I quote, for more than a decade, the FDA has shown a pattern of burying the details of misconduct. As a result, nobody ever finds out which data is bogus, which experiments are tainted, and which drugs might be on the market under false pretenses. The FDA has repeatedly hid hidden evidence of scientific fraud, not just from the public, but also from its most trusted scientific advisors, even as they were deciding whether or not a new drug should be allowed on the market even a congressional panel investigating a case of fraud regarding a dangerous drug couldn't get forthright answers. For an agency devoted to protecting the public from bogus me medical science, the FDA seems to be spending an awful lot of effort protecting the perpetrators of bogus science from the public. And I would add the interests of politicians, big agribusiness, and the food companies to these dubious bedfellows, and I'd be adding the mainstream consumer to the casket. So this is our mainstream news machine. These are the sources that inform and influence our society on a largely global scale. We look to some of the sources here as maybe being a little more cred credible than others. Um, in other words, maybe more in alignment with a particular political bias that we might have, perhaps. Um, but some of you may or may not realize that essentially all of the mainstream televised radio and print media, not just the news, but all of the media, including all of these news sources, are owned and fully controlled by no more than five or six corporate entities, where there used to be dozens um, of different ones. And there's plenty of both light, uh, left and right wing bias to go around here, folks. It's not all one or the other, despite what you hear with certain people. And all of the news media operate by superficial talking point reporting that is largely supplied in spoon-feeding spoon feeding fashion by major carefully controlled news feeds that go out basically to all of the major news sources which then dutifully report accordingly. That's how it works. True journalism is a modern day rarity. It's an endangered species more rare and scarce than moon dust. And is any of this shocking to you? Because it really should be. You know, most news stories rely on sensationalism, shock and awe to capture and manipulate its audiences. 
They leave us little more than stressed, overwhelmed, feeling helpless and hopeless, and even depressed, you know, by design. Mainstream journalism, and to some degree even academia and other institutions, including education, have long been unduly influenced at the hands of transnational corporate interests in tandem with shadow intelligence agencies since all the way back in 1947. And gosh, I wanted to go into this so much more. I just, not time, but it's so well documented. Look up Carl Bernstein's expose on Operation Mockingbird and also the findings of the 1976 Church Committee sometime and realize this is not just something that happened once upon a time. This is not a thing of the past. I've got news for you. Those were the good old days, <laughs> right? It's highly pertinent to what's going on today. <clears throat> so we should all be turning CNN and the rest of it off and for a whole bunch of reasons. Now this article from The Guardian is both uncharacteristically insightful, superb, and actually really important. It lists all of the areas that have research to show the ways in which mainstream news compromises your life. Uh, in the article, they showed how the mainstream news misleads and overrides rational thinking. How mainstream news is irrelevant to anything that has the potential to improve the quality of your life. How the news is literally toxic to your body and brain. You know, we become cortisol factories watching this. News increases cognitive errors in people that watch it frequently. News inhibits thinking. Um, and it, news works like a drug, literally altering structures in your brain. All of this is documented in the article. It wastes your time. It makes us passive, right? Um, and it also kills creativity. And in short, they say news is bad for your health. It leads to fear and aggression, and it hinders your creativity and your ability to think deeply. I mean, these are hallmarks of the society we live in, folks. The solution, stop consuming it altogether. And then also, and this is a gem, most of us do not yet understand that mainstream news is to the mind what sugar is to the body. So how the heck do they get away with all this? How do the sleazy corporate interests get away with it all? Here's how. We're mostly kept distracted, not to mention dumbed down. In fact, it's sort of the point of it all. The other thing they do is they find ways of pitting us against each other by fomenting polarizing issues in the press, you know, unleashing paid sock puppets, in other words, trolls over targeted social media sites, and keeping us focused on our differences from one another instead of whether or instead of whatever it is that we might share in common in ways that might, God forbid, bring us together. But all of this is little more than a scratch on the tip of a much deeper and much more nefarious iceberg. It's also really important to point out that as a species that evolved in the wild, we are wired for what can be termed tangible threats, right? If a saber-toothed cat comes after us, <laughs> that's tangible, you know? If we're being ch chased or charged by a cantankerous woolly mammoth, that's tangible, you know, or we see a poisonous snake or something, or if there's a warring tribe or a major storm or a seismic event or maybe a major volcanic eruption or something, or maybe a famine. Those are all things that we are wired to recognize as threats that require our action and self-protection. So fast forward to the 21st century where we're all living in comfortable climate-controlled environments, right? Where most of us in the Western world don't need to take more than one or two steps in any direction to be able to grab a handful of something we think of as food and eat it, right? Everyone is sitting in their nice soft couches at home in the evenings watching Dancing with the Stars and eating cheesy doodles, right? And I don't care if you're living in Minnesota in February, you know, where it's 40 degrees below zero outside, winter isn't coming for us anymore. So the vast majority of us live in this state of false complacency, right? We don't see the threat. But we're also living in an era that is demonstrably far more dangerous, and by far the most dangerous and most perilous of our entire evolutionary history. Yet most of what threatens us today is largely invisible to us. We're simply not wired for that. For instance, contaminants in our air, water, and food supply, right? GMOs, glyphosate, fluoride, you know, bio sludge, you know, EMF pollution, radiation contamination, and on and on, not to mention predatory corporate control or, you know, um, or the erosion of our most fundamental human rights as our Constitution and Bill of Rights is just sort of crumbling into oblivion, but nobody wants to see it. We are obliviously pissing it all away. And thank God for Monday Night Football, though, huh? <laughs> I mean, we can simply ignore all that and pretend it's not there. You know, just have a beer and feel it all fade away blissfully into nothingness, 
It's a national pastime, right? We are just like those metaphorical boiling frogs, right, that, that are living with the illusion that we're sitting in a hot tub in Vegas. And this mindset makes us especially malleable. So now we've all heard of this phenomenon, right? We all need to sit up and pay attention to what's actually happening here. In contrast to what we're all being told about this concern, it turns out that actual fake news comes in several different varieties. There's the funny kind that you see with like Jon Stewart and, and uh, Stephen Colbert and Saturday Night Live. The slightly less funny kind uh, you know, that you see in the tabloids. And then there's the predatory and even potentially illegal variety made by the Pentagon and multinational corporate and banking influencers. This includes, by the way, Big Pharma, for whom there is a representative sitting on every single board of every single television news outlet. Um, and the CDC, by the way, is a corporate entity trading on Wall Street and profiting from many of the things that it's supposed to be regulating. I'm digressing, but... Um, but we're being led to believe that the alternative media, the one in which... Uh, the one w that is in much more relentless pursuit of the truth is the actual fake news enemy. Right? Many of us here have blogs or social media that would, uh, that, would, that would readily be characterized as fake news by the mainstream media machine, right? by mainstream authorities of different kinds. Right now, it's just name calling. But don't think that they're prepared to stop at that. And this is going to get ugly. And in certain places around the world, including here, it already has. In Malaysia, posting anything online or in social media or YouTube deemed to be incorrect right, or misleading by the authorities is literally against the law now and is punishable by prison time and or exorbitant fines. There's actually at least one conviction that's taken place already. And in France, Germany, and elsewhere in the e EU, similar legislation has either been passed or is being considered along with the UK. Lots is happening right now in this arena and none of it, I'm here to tell you, is good. You know, here's a headline from France, here's, you know, this is where things are potentially headed. Um, and by the way, the new Malaysian law loosely defines fake news as news information, data, and reports which are wholly or partly false and includes features, visuals, and audio recordings also covering digital publication and social media. Of course, interpretation of what's true or false is up to the discretion of the authorities that are frequently the target of alternative news articles and criticisms. So one journalist speaking out on this dangerous global trend had the guts to point out that, and I quote, not reporting something is as dangerous as reporting something that is false. This kind of legislation would disincentivize journalists from publishing the truth. Sort of the point, I think. Again, when we talk about alternative news media being accused of <laughs> creating fake news, <laughs> this is not what we're talking about. Now, we could easily be, I know it's hysterical, isn't it? We could easily be talking about someone trying to write a thoughtful piece on, say, the link between autism and vaccines, for instance, or an article about the many potential harmful effects of statin drugs, or the harm associated with officially sanctioned, um, you know, low-fat diets, or the benefits associated with quality animal, you know, source food diets. I can tell you that in countries like Australia, which I'm very familiar with, alternative news articles like these are already resulting in extreme responses from authorities. Targeted social media attacks, harassment, investigation, and even the risk of loss of licensure if you happen to be a medical provider. Now think for a moment what happened to Tim Noakes in South Africa, right? Tip of the iceberg of what's coming. Or to Gary Fedke in Australia, many of you are familiar with. The mainstream media in Australia is swift and merciless in its attacks uh, on anything that challenges the mainstream narrative. And it's it's really pretty terrifying. Um, over there, even so much as discussing the benefits of an ancestrally-based diet can land you in massively hot water in the media and lead to brutal personal attacks over social media. When one woman recently um, attempted to speak at a, at a university on the benefits of a diet based in quality fats, and when word got out, she was mercilessly pilloried in the press, subjected to public ridicule, banned from that university and forbidden, forbidden from ever speaking at a university in Australia ever again. Now, I was the first in the ancestral health genre to actually bring uh, these ideas to Australia. And I've actually spoken to three or four different universities in, in Australia over the years. But that was before the ancestral health genre began taking off in earnest there. Now that it's actually achieved a very widespread kind of mainstream popularity, um, uh, 
you know, it poses a real threat to the status quo. It's no longer tolerated by the press or authorities. And the media is being relentless in its condemnation, its so-called debunking uh, and ridicule of the ancestral health genre. And since Australians lack a similar constitution or bill of rights that Americans have the illusion of protecting them, the government and its media machine are far more brazen in their control measures. And I don't know if you guys have seen the magic pill, but the, uh, the Australian version, yeah, it's awesome, isn't it? The Australian version of the AMA over there is trying to get that film um, banned. All right, in Australia, they're, they're trying to get it officially, but they won't be able to do it, but. So this article published in the Harvard Law Review, all the way back in June of 2014, offered a chilling description of what was already happening way back then at that time. The article stated that, quote, private companies that run social media sites and search engines are the main arbiters of what gets communicated in the brave new world of cyberspace. And despite their good intentions and their claims to free speech philosophy, these companies employ terms of service that censor a broad range of constitutionally protected speech. Now this Harvard Law Review article also stated and referenced a supportive citation for the following. Facebook wields more power today in determining who can speak than any Supreme Court justice, any king, or any president. And unlike censorship, uh, censorship decisions by government agencies, the process in the private world of social media is secret. And Facebook has recently committed itself to an all-out war using an undisclosed, some sort of undisclosed algorithm against so-called fake news. That includes, by the way, health-related topics. Facebook pages in the health-related genre are already coming down. Now, Google censors its general searches too. Alternative news web pages are starting to get systematically buried in the search engines. I don't know if you've been noticing this. Also, certain studies that are not in alignment with the mainstream narrative are also becoming harder and harder to locate and are, are hidden behind paywalls now. The especially outspoken website, Natural News, was actually removed from search en engines altogether for a time until Mike Adams took aggressive legal action, got it reinstated. He had money and the know-how to do that, not all of us do. So can we really rely on capitalism to save us, right? Do we really believe that we have any control whatsoever on the market forces supplying us with food products and whatever else? And do we really believe that the mom and pop business operations working extra hard to do the right things in the right way for the right reasons are operating on a level playing field in our society with transnational corporate interests? Seriously? So the number one thing everyone needs to realize is that corporations have but one obligation and one obligation only. And that obligation is not to provide us with quality anything or remotely healthy, efficacious products that are environmentally responsible, nor are they obligated to provide us, in reality, with truth in advertising. There are loopholes in the labeling laws alone that are big enough to drive an aircraft carrier through. Their only obligation is to supply profit for their shareholders. That's it. Um, nothing else, really. And increasingly, the laws are being written not only to promote the consumer, but instead, yikes, to promote the profits of transnational industries that they truly serve. What capitalism amounts to nowadays is ever larger companies buying up ever smaller companies and edging out any semblance of fair competition with better quality mom and pop products by using things like pricing undercuts, deceptive advertising, predatory marketing practices as a means of putting everyone else out of business. We think of capitalism as being synonymous with democracy and, or the antithesis of socialism, um, but in reality, it's the antithesis of anything representing freedom. It represents a hegemonic corporate monopoly on everything, including our lawmakers. Do I trust the marketplace to give me healthy and sustainable food that I want and demand simply because I'm asking for it? Not for a single instant. So here's what we can trust companies to do. We can trust them to tell us what they think we want to hear, simply as a means of selling us whatever. Food labeling laws are written for them and not for us, along with most of the rest of what governs our food supply. The organic standard is rapidly becoming eroded to something borderline meaningless. Certain popular companies claiming to be selling us grass-fed meat in their products reveal the use of GMOs in the fine print on their website. And I've got news for you. A box of gluten-free, organic, supposedly zero trans fat, low-carb, non-GMO, so-called paleo or keto-friendly brownie mix is still crap. <laughs> and by the way, this all has absolutely nothing to do with any one political party or politician. They're all guilty of collusion with transnational corporate industry and the global banking system when it comes to prioritizing profit over people, the environment, or ethics. National politics is little more than a distraction. And engaging local politics is ultimately our best strategy for getting anything done in the political sphere. 
There's a Chinese proverb that tells us, unless we change directions, we're likely to end up where we are going. So let's just say we're not headed in an exactly in a positive direction. So what steps are needed to counter this trend? All right, we have to understand the nature of the matrix we are in if we can begin to even figure out how to shift the balance of power and increase the responsibility and leadership of, of humanity. So here's what we all need to think about doing to counter the mess that we're in. I know, I'm sorry, I just have to keep going after until I'm dragged off. Um, <laughs> I'll arm wrestle you for it. <laughs> so number one, take the red pill. Be willing to truly see what is happening, right? Um, do your homework, in other words, dig, and don't just rely on sound bites or your favorite blogger to get to the bottom of things for you. Be brave, speak the truth, and where appropriate, consider civil disobedience. You know, they can't get us all. Um, don't let yourself and your life be governed by fear. Take thoughtful and considered action, including highly focused, intense legislative pressure. You know, we still have some illusion of, of, of due process and we need to take advantage of that. Be a Girl Scout or Boy Scout in all of this, right? Focus primarily on localization, local politics, and community, and develop a first-hand knowing of where your food actually comes from now as much as humanly possible. Do what you can to inspire and not proselytize or battle others. Um, in the world that we live in, filled with all sorts of things we seemingly have no control over, it's incumbent upon us to take control of what we can. Meditate. Just learn to operate in the calm center of the cyclone and, and wind down your mental chaos. This is way more important than you think. And remember that we are all in this together and that your neighbor is not your enemy. We're all much more alike than unalike and our values and needs as human beings and we need to be focused on that. We also should be supporting the considerable efforts of activists like Scott Tips and the National, well actually International Health Federation. Nobody ever hears about this organization. These are our sole representatives of actual food freedom at the International Codex Alimentarius meetings. They are literally what stand between us and the laws governing the long-term quality of our food supply, not to mention access to nutritional supplements, which is going away. Obviously, we should also be supporting things like the Savory Institute and Farm to Consumer and other activist organizations. You know, so be, become an activist if you can, but at the very least, support the activists. Please don't do this <laughs> or this, right? <laughs> and by the way, no one is coming to save us. And official policy and mainstream practices, people, they're never going to change, not ever, from the top down. Our power lies in the grassroots, literally and figuratively. Our best health and future is up to us. We are the ones we've been waiting for, right? <laughs> Thank you. Wise and timely words from our friend George Orwell. I don't know, is it 1984 yet? Um, don't forget to speak out and take action. Be a revolutionary. What is the biggest killer in the world? Here's your answer. It's apathy. So most of all, keep calm and care enough to choose the red pill, the one supplement we should all be taking each and every day. And one final reminder, it, it's no measure. It's no measure of health to be well adjusted to, to a profoundly sick society. So let's wake up and work together. Thank you. Thank you. And I wish to hell I had time to answer questions. <laughs>